Good morning. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. You know, I just want to say a word about Operation Christmas Child. And uh, Dave has spent many hours here already uh, preparing for Operation Christmas Child. If you look out, as you go out into the narthex to the right, you'll see hundreds, how many boxes? There's 500 boxes out there. And so he's, he's put a lot of work into it already. And you can go grab a box, talk to him about Operation Christmas Child. And I really appreciate all the work he's doing behind the scenes. One of those quiet uh, behind the scenes people that's doing uh, work in a ministry and and really that's that's the way the church operates isn't it that that's the function you think about everything done here for the most part is done through volunteer ministry our sound team gets here I don't know what time seven thirty in the morning or so and they're here the musicians are here a long time then uh, you look around believe it or not this the beautiful board and batten was done by volunteers uh, believe it or not it wasn't a contractor the, the beautiful landscaping, and, and the landscape looks tremendous this year, was done by volunteers. Uh, many volunteers have been working on that. And uh, the, the children's ministry and the nursery. And if you're not involved some way in the church ministry, remember this. It, you, some people say, well, I want to be involved in spiritual work. But the Bible says if you give a cup of cold water in my name, you get a reward. And so serving in this capacity the facility or the services in a background type uh, service is not unspiritual ministry. It's, it's ministering to saints of God. So I just want to thank all the volunteers. I know I left out a ton of people. I apologize. There are a ton of volunteers here, and we could use more. We, we have some areas that uh, we could use more volunteers in. So just wanted to, to say that real quickly. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Paul describes his gospel flexibility, and it's really about evangelism, and evangelism is is controversial today, isn't it? Uh, We're we're well aware that uh, it's increasingly common in our culture, in our society, to think of evangelism as intolerant and coercive. You know, even a careful, gentle, loving but faithful presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ is often met with a, fr- a frustrated, sometimes angry, often equally intolerant response from people in our society. So much so that sometimes we can be a, a little bit gun shy as Christians to speak about Jesus, if you're like me anyway. But wait, is gun shy appropriate term to use anymore? Or is that politically incorrect? Is that too much? But... Um, um, we're, we're left with a range of questions, complicated questions that we, we need to ask. For example, um, how do we flex in response to questions and concerns of this generation with understanding and care without making so many adjustments that we lose the gospel altogether? Legitimate question. How do we get engaged and stay engaged in frontline mission, pressing the claims of King Jesus, calling people everywhere to repent and do this with boldness and urgency. How do we get engaged, I'm sorry, how do we do that without confirming the worst stereotypes of of, uh, the world has about Christians and the way they evangelize? How how do we endure suspicion and hostility uh, in our society towards evangelism without wimping out altogether? And remember, that's the task that Jesus left us to do, isn't it? Go. Go and preach the gospel. Go and make disciples. And so in the passage today that we're going to look at, we're going to read and and preach from, Paul helps us to think through some of these questions. So if you'll stand with me, we'll read 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 23. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant of all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, so that not being myself under the law, I might win those who are under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, under the law of Christ, that I might win those 
outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all. Listen to what he says. This is a summary. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. We thank you for the evangelistic heart of the Apostle Paul. We thank you for his transparency. We thank you for his passion. Lord, I, I pray that as we think through this passage, that not only will we understand what he's saying, but you will uh, give us an eternal passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ, proclaiming it to all who we know and that we see in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. One of the the characteristics of this passage is we see his determination for evangelism. Notice what drives him in verse number uh, 19. He says, he says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant all, that I might win more of them. That's his passion. I might win more of them. Five times in this passage, he says his goal is to win people. He says in, in verse number 19, that I may win more of them. In verse number 20, he says to win the Jews and to win those that are under the law. In verse 21, he says he's seeking to win those outside the law. In verse number 22, uh, he says uh, that he wants to win the weak. And so the driving passion of the Apostle Paul is to win people to Jesus. He's not mixing it up in the arena of ideas. He's not engaged in, in social change. He's not casually throwing out suggestions for disinterested people. He has one drive. One drive, and that is to win people to Christ. That's his drive. Look at verse number 19 with me. I want you to notice the disadvantage that he places himself in. This gives you the intensity, not only how he repeats it, what he's doing, but notice the intensity with which he, he is uh, striving here. He says this, he says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a slave to all. So here's Paul willing to put himself at a disadvantage. He, he's a slave to all. He says, He's a freedman, and, and you, you, I'm going to unpack this so you understand this a little bit more. Paul, we know, is a highly educated person. He's extremely intelligent, and it, when he comes into Corinth, it is his right to get paid for preaching the gospel because he's ministering to the church in Corinth. Everybody understood that when Corinth was a place, and we described this, where these or, or, orators or orators or whatever you want to call them, these public speakers would come in, and they would, they would speak, and they would always have a wealthy benefactor who paid their way, and part of this, remember, we said was, if, if somebody's paying your way, you got to say something nice about them. Kind of, kind of uh, we understand that. We see that in today's society as well. And instead of taking that pay, Paul instead makes himself a slave to all. And what's important about this, what's important about when he says, I'm a slave to all, is in, in the Roman society, the Greco-Roman culture, there's two distinct kinds of people, slaves and free, okay? Um, according to Roman law, the principal distinction made by the law is a, of a person is this. All human beings are either free or slaves. I'm reading from an ancient source. In Greek and Roman culture, slave and free seemed as natural a distinction as dividing the human race between men and women, or young and old. Slave and free was that natural distinction. And so for a person, and this is important, for a person to become a slave was to give up their identity. As a matter of fact, I found this, this uh, scholars have termed what happened in that society when one became a slave, they term it social death. 
It's like you do not exist. If you're a slave, you have no existence. I don't know if anybody's experienced um, you do not exist in our system. I, I haven't experienced that one yet. I'm sure somebody has. But, um, but as a slave, you do not exist in society. And here's the reason why, and this is important, because essentially the slave serves as a surrogate body for the slaveholder. So the slave does what the slaveholder either does not want to do or cannot do. Or the slave goes to a place where the slaveholder can't be because he's got another engagement. And so you're like the proxy, you're the surrogate body of the the holder. And Paul said, I willingly give up my privileges associated with my education to become a manual laborer. And in that society, I've mentioned this before, a manual labor is, a, is kind of a low life. The elites look down their nose at those kind of people. And Paul adopted a position of, of a powerless slave in order to bring salvation to those he serves. So think about this. Paul does not lead from a secure position above everyone else. Instead, he in, was um, serving from a position below them, incarnating literally the, the foolishness of the cross. Isn't the cross foolish? Right? Isn't that so opposite of our desires? Let's be honest. We, we can be honest here, right? That's the opposite of our desires. You know, we, we want to be acknowledged by the elite in our society. Yeah, your opinion's legitimate. Yeah, you're a pretty smart guy or you're a pretty successful person. We want, we want those people who are the movers and shakers of our society to, to view us this way. We want to be viewed as wise or smart or culturally up to date. But you know what? That is completely incompatible with our commission. If your goal is to win those around you, listen, if your goal is to win those around you, you will automatically be sneered at by them. Paul covered that thoroughly in the first part of of 1 Corinthians when he's talking about becoming a fool for Christ. It's the foolishness of that gospel being preached. You'll be viewed as a simpleton who believes superstition. You'll be viewed as somebody who believes a book written by some backwoods sheep herders. You'll be viewed as weak. But here's the beautiful thing. You ready? When you value the approval of Christ more than the praise of men, then like Paul, you will be willing to be viewed as a fool. Isn't that wonderful? Whose approval are we living for? We are left on earth to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the reason we're here. We're here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's his goal. That's his drive. But I want to show you how flexible he is in this. And he, he gives three ways that he adapts himself to win others. Now, there's a, there's a lot of confusion about these verses, Back in the 1980s, there was a, uh, a movement among churches that became very popular called the seeker-sensitive movement. That's what we call it today. It's been called many names. And I'm sure many of you understand what that, that movement is. Basically, it says this. We want lost people to come to our church, so we're going to go out. We're going to find out what they like and what they don't like about church And then we're going to craft our service, we're going to craft our message to please those people. We want them to be comfortable in our church service. Let me ask you a question. Is that what Paul is saying in these verses? There's a lot of people who think that. That's what he's saying. The whole movement is still going on today. And they water down the gospel They water down the hard truths. They begin to talk about temporal things that we've been noting are going to pass away. 
how to be a good husband, how to be a great father, how to have a good marriage, how to get along well with your employee, how, how to um, be joyful when bad things happen, and, and all these sort of things, right? And they're missing the main thing, and the main thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's just look here real quick, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to explain what he's talking about here. Number one, he says, to the Jews, I became a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though myself not being under the law, that I may win those under the law. So here's Paul, even though he's no longer constrained to Jewish ceremonial laws, he would gladly follow them if they would open the door for witnessing to the Jews. He was restraining his freedom for the love of the people that he witnessed to. Does that make sense? I've got this restriction that I grew up under called the law when I was a Pharisee. I now believe Jesus Christ. I understand that all of those old things have passed away. I'm not under any of them. I can eat a cheeseburger if I want. I can eat sausage, okay? I can eat whatever the pagans eat or whatever the, the law is, the ceremonial law. He is now free from that. But Paul said, I will restrain my freedom in order to win the Jews. Now, I've seen that in action. Heather and Jeffrey have too. When we go to Israel, we go to a place called Yad Hashmanah, which means Yad 8. And that is a, a kibbutz. I'm not going to explain what it is, but it's a place that we stay. They're a Jewish Christian community who have this beautiful facility on a mountaintop on the Judean hills. It is gorgeous. When you look down the hill that way, you're looking at Emmaus. And then you turn around and look up the hill this way, about a mile away, Kiriath Jerim, where the Ark of the Covenant was for 20 years. Literally, you can walk to that spot if you want to and see where the Ark of the Covenant was for 20 years. It's gorgeous. They've been, they've, they've been well, anyway, I'm getting uh, beside myself. I just get excited when, I'm, when I think about it. But what do they do? They have, this, they have this banqueting facility. It's all glassed in, and you, see, you have that view in front of you. It's a beautiful facility. They have a fourth century synagogue that you can have services on. And, and that it was from Galilee. They moved the whole synagogue 40, 50 miles down to their facility. It's incredible um, there in Israel. But this is what they do, or they did. I'll explain why it's did in just a second. But they followed all the kosher laws of food preparation and everything else because Jewish people, it was such a beautiful facility, they would come in and they would have bar mitzvahs there. They've had weddings and all sorts of uh, celebrations there. And even um, the cabinet, Benjamin Netanyahu and his cabinet members had meetings at their facilities from time to time. Um, the problem is, and they don't, they don't uh, stringent, they don't advertise they follow the kosher laws, even though for the most part they do. And the reason they did that, let me back up and get ahead of myself. The reason they did that is so that they could share the gospel with these people. And they shared the gospel with many, many people as they came through in that facility. That was the goal. And that's what Paul was doing, wasn't it? Paul limited himself so that um, he uh, would not offend. By the way, all these pictures are from their um, facility. Anybody hungry? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, I kind of like, uh, just a little side note, yeah, the cheesecake um, and the pie. But uh, anyway, uh, long story short, they, they had a, um, a lesbian couple want to come in and have a wedding. And they, they, they refused, and because of that, they went ahead and just, they, they nixed the whole thing just because it, uh, it became a, a big problem. So anyway, Paul, in his sincere desire to win his fellow Jews, was willing to put himself under that Jewish ceremonial food laws and the other things in order that he might win the Jews. Make sense? That's what, they're, that's what they do in Israel, they follow Paul. He, so much so that he said, brothers, 
My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved, talking about his fellow Jews. He went so far as to say, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now remember something. This is the desire of the apostle to who? To whom? The Gentiles. He was called to the Gentiles, but his desire was to see his fellow Jews trust Christ as their Savior. So restraining from eating certain foods was a relatively small price to pay for him to be able to win some. In Acts 16, if you remember, uh, Paul wanted to take Timothy with him uh, in his ministry. And so Timothy was circumcised because of the Jews who were in the places where they were going. Timothy was circumcised. Um, Timothy's circumcision was of no benefit to him and certainly not to Paul. It didn't do anything for them, but it could be a great benefit to their ministry among the Jews and was a small price to pay for the prospect of winning some of them over to the Lord. At the advice of James and other leaders, Paul willingly paid for and participated in Jewish purification ceremony with four other Jewish Christians. We see this in Acts 21. And he did that so that he could teach the Jews that he was not completely abandoning Moses for his Christianity. Secondly, he says, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, but under the law of Christ that I might win those outside the law. What was Paul? Paul was willing to live like a Gentile when he worked among the Gentiles. He identified as closely as he could to their customs. He ate what they ate. He went where they went. He dressed as they dressed. And the purpose was to win the Gentiles to Christ. He's not being a hypocrite. Is he? No, that's the, that's the best way that you can win someone. Now notice what he says in there. In, in verse number 21, he says, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. And what, is he, what, is he, what does that mean? Are there two gods? They have two different wills? That's very interesting. Uh, let's just look at that real quick. The, what is the law of Christ? Well, I think that other scriptures clarify it. Galatians 5.14 says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, right? You should love your neighbor as yourself. Who said that? Christ said that, right? Matthew, I think it's 19. And he was quoting Leviticus, I believe, 19 when he did that. Paul gives a more detailed explanation in Romans uh, chapter 13, verses 8 to 10. He says, oh, no one anything except to love each other for whoever loves one another has fulfilled the law. And then he, he describes what that is. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Um, as any other commandments are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbors yourself. Love does no wrong to its neighbor because love, therefore, is the fulfilling of the law. And so the law of Christ is to love others. So he's loving these Gentiles when he behaves like Gentiles. And he's loving the Jews when he behaves like the Jews, but he's not being a hypocrite. And then he says this. He says in verse number 22, I, to the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Now he leaves the uh, basic Jewish Gentile dualism and um, address a part of the question that was asked in, in the previous chapter, in chapter number 8. How should the Corinthians relate to those who they consider weak? Now we have to ask the question, who are the weak? Now remember what we learned in chapter number 8. The weak in the church were those who felt like they had to observe these things. Remember that? Those weak in conscience. But I think in this passage... The weak would not be talking about those people because they're already believers, right? So who then would he be talking about? I don't have time to, to fully describe this, but let's think about what Paul did. Paul, Paul um, was a 
he had the right to accept a salary from the Corinthians, but instead he became a tent maker, right? Now, tent makers, I already said, were the marginalized in society. They were marginalized by the elite. So the weak, I think he's describing here, are the marginalized people of the society. He worked alongside the powerless in order to seek their salvation. So he became all things to all people that he might by all means save some. He didn't compromise the gospel. He he would not change the least truth in any way to order to satisfy someone. He, but he would condescend in any way to anyone if that would help bring that person to Christ. He never set aside a truth of the gospel. He would gladly restrict his liberty. He would not offend Jew or the weak. And so we have an evangelistic principle I want to give you. This is important. If a person is offended by God's word... That is, he's offended by biblical doctrine or, dis, or church discipline, then that's his problem, okay? But if that person is offended by God, is if, um, that person is offended by God, I'm sorry. But if that person is offended by our unnecessary behavior practices, no matter how good or acceptable they may be, his problem becomes our problem. Let me give you an example. I have a pastor friend who's on social media all the time. And all his social media posts, I mean, you literally hardly would believe he's a pastor because all his social media posts are political. And they're always, I shouldn't say always, they're many times inflammatory, complaining about the other side of the aisle politically. Many people talk to him about it, but he doesn't see it. I think he's got willful blinders, but that's another thing. He's a friend of mine, and I've talked to him about it. Um, my guess is that the majority of people who are unsaved, who know his outspoken positions, are never going to listen to his gospel presentation because of the way he conducts himself on social media. So when you openly mock politicians or demonize people who don't hold your political beliefs or you post uh, content that's offensive or edgy, you hurt your Christian witness. That, that's an example of what I'm talking about here. I would, I would appeal to you to think very carefully about how you act in social media, think about your evangelistic witness every time you post something, every time you interact with some, someone, Christian or non-Christian, because the whole world can see your posts, right? Think about your evangelistic witness. I think that would help tremendously. Paul said in verse number 22 that by all means I might save some. He did all of this to share the gospel. He was an apostle. You, you say, yeah, but, you know, Jared, he was an apostle. That's his job, right? True, but what was our command? What was our commission? Go everywhere. Everywhere we're going, preach the gospel. You know, I try to practice that as best I can, but Mike Webb's getting tired of me witnessing to him. <laughs> you know, seriously, though, in the last uh, two months, I, I befriended a man who just had mouth surgery for throat cancer, just in his recovery from chemo, and been talking to him, and uh, he's warming up. He's getting now where uh, he, he comes to me uh, without me coming to him first, and uh, pretty soon I think I'm going to be able to share the gospel with him. That's my goal. I, not, that's not my only goal. That's one of my goals with him. Uh, have another man who's a Catholic I've been able to share the gospel with him. Interestingly enough, he's got a son-in-law that is an that a evangelical pastor. He told me that after I witnessed him. That's what my son-in-law told me. 
Still working on him. Did you know I'm listening to hip hop? I befriended a young man locally who's a hip hop artist and been watching his YouTube videos. Why? Because I want to be able to talk to him about what, what he's singing and what he's doing because I do genuinely care about him. I'm interested in him. But at some point, I want to be able to tell him about Jesus Christ. These are ways I'm, I'm working to share the gospel. And um, when, I, when I was up north, again, my secretary got tired of me witnessing to her. So I got to do something. I joined the fire department and the rescue squad. I didn't do these things because I had a burning desire to be a fireman. I had a burning desire to drive an ambulance or pick people up off you know, where, the floor or whatever. But I had 60 people who I regularly was able to talk with about the Lord. Families, I had one whole family get, get saved. I had more individuals get saved. I performed the wedding of one of my lieutenants on the fire department, counseled couples who the husband was on the fire department, was able to do marital counseling with them. And someone would say, you're the only person I know in this community who, who genuinely cares about me, won't, won't gossip and has, has some answers. These were opportunities came about because I displayed interest in people and, and um, did what Paul was talking about, became like them. We, we had, up in northern Wisconsin, there are no restaurants. If you want to go to a restaurant up where we lived, you had to go to a bar. And so the Christmas parties were always at a bar. And I remember the first one I went to, there's like 40 people from the rescue squad there at a bar. They had their happy hour and then food was uh, an hour later. So I came at food time and not happy hour time, right? And I walk in, I'm sitting in a bar, and, and I'm a, I grew up Baptist, so you know what that means, right? And, and all of a sudden, as we sit down for the meal, and the director of rescue squad said, hey, Jerry, can you pray for the meal? And I thought to myself, this is, this is really surreal. I've never prayed in a bar before, so right? But why am I telling you all this? I'm not telling you this to build myself up. I'm not. I rarely talk about my evangelistic opportunities. I'm telling you this so to encourage you to think about people who you come in regular contact with who needs Jesus, who need Jesus Christ. That's our commission. We have the greatest news in the world. We're called to do that. I love the service today. It's, it's like convergence. Lena, this week, unbeknownst to her uh, what I was going to preach on, if you go to the bulletin board over here, has, has tracks on display on the bulletin board. I don't know if anybody saw that yet. Uh, we had Operation Christmas Child, evangelism around the world. I mean, it's just, it, it comes together. We need to be sharing the gospel. I got to close. I'm already over time, but let me say this. Paul said, I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. There, when you share the gospel, even if people don't get saved, you have a blessing. If they get saved, you share in the blessing with them. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Well, my prayer is that we are gripped with the wonder of Christ and that God will grip our hearts with a longing to see sinners saved. What a wonderful message we carry. And there are people everywhere. You, you rub shoulders with them every day. Lord, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul, the guidance that he gives us how to how to live in a society, how to live in, in such a way that our demeanor is not a, an offense. If there's an offense, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that you will instill in our hearts a burning passion for Jesus and the gospel, a burning passion for the lost and those to be saved, that we will not be timid but rather we'll be bold and confident in the way that we share the gospel because the power is in the message itself, not in the person who delivers it, not in the way we deliver it, but rather, Lord, it's your word, and your word has the power. Lord, make Providence Bible Church an evangelistic church going out, telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. Amen.